Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the country's biggest stars and some of my favourite people and a comedian who I've loved for over three decades. He's been performing around the world, not only in Liverpool, where he was born, and of course made his name. Stan Borman, how lovely to talk to you. Uh, nice to talk to you, Alex, yes. How are you doing, first of all? I mean, we've seen you on the TV over the last 40, maybe 50 years now. Uh, are you still at it? Yeah, I'm still at it. And uh, f- funny enough, I was in Norwich uh, yesterday at um, the showground with uh, 3,000 people in this big uh, big building. So, yeah, and it went down really well. So. Yes, and then it took me four and a half hours to drive back to Liverpool. <laughs> That's the hard thing about show business, isn't it? That you get on and do your 45 minutes, but it can take you 10 times as long to get there. Does well, that get actually, tiring? I, yeah, I, well, I did an hour and, a, hour and a half, so the 45 minutes have gone now. So right. <laughs> uh, it seems as if they want a little bit more when they do these big shows. But uh, I've got enough material to, to go on forever. So driving, that gets... Uh, us comedians and entertainers down driving all over the place. We love it when we're on the stage, but it's a nightmare in the cafes and the uh, stopping off of the motorways and up and down the roads and roadblocks and everything. You know, you can't get anywhere these days. I'm going to ask you a question I should have probably asked later, but how do you remember it all? When you stand on a stage and you've got 90 minutes ahead of you and no script, where does it come from? Well, I think the thing is, you do actually have a script in your head. Well, you'd have a skeleton of one, and I, I tend to work better that way rather than have something that is uh, set in stone. I, uh, I'm all over the place with the, with the show, so that sometimes when I get up there, I start from the end and uh, back go <laughs> back to the beginning, or start in the middle and go from the, you know either side. So it's sort of. Uh, I don't know. It works better to be that way than than just having a script that is sort of uh, every you know you, you know what's coming next, and you sort of like automatic pilot. I'm not on automatic pilot because any any I'm ready for anything that would happen within the in this show. You know, so uh, if you if you really go on automatic pilot and something happens, you, you tend to lose track of uh, where you are with it. Mm. Let's go back to the beginning and talk about you as a boy. Of course, Liverpool was the place that you're so synonymous with. Did you sort of up the ante with your accent to make that your gimmick, or is that really the person you are? Because Liverpool is so associated with you. Yeah, I couldn't change the accent, uh, and I've never tried to change it. Um, when I go to certain places, though, you know, it's sort of uh, up Newcastle, and, and they've got a, a, a great accent, you know, and uh, I sort of try to round off words when I'm up there so that they can understand it. But uh, 30 or 40 years ago, it was a little bit different. Now everybody's sort of, you know, the Geordie language is, is in vogue with the... Uh, uh, so the Devon and Cornwall accents involved, but years ago, the Scottish accent, it, it, it was, uh, people didn't listen at all to, uh, because accents were so hard to listen to, but because of, you know, the coverage with uh, television and Sky and Big Brother and all them sort of thing, programs, we've tend to sort of train our voices to uh, be able to cope with these different accents. So when, when I was, I mean, yes, the Scousers say uh, certain words that the rest of the, the country find funny. And, and that's where I got most of my act with the Germans, because I told one German joke, I think it was in Carlisle, and the next minute everybody in the audience went, Germans, you know, and I didn't think that was anything wrong with that, because everyone in Liverpool said Germans, you know. Right. And then I saw a thought, of, well, I, well, I'll throw, throw a, new, a few more gags here, because if you've got a laugh, saying Germans, then I'll, I'll throw curtains at curtains, and then the next one, it was skating boards. <laughs> people tend to sort of laugh at them, so there's no joke, but they're just laughing at your accent, which, uh, and I did the summertime special with Val Dunican down south, if you remember the summertime specials, and uh, there's a big marquee tent with about 4,000 people in, and it was uh, it went out every Saturday in, in, the, in the summer, it was, and, uh, and another one called Seaside Special. Um, I told a joke about uh, a skating board. Well, 4,000 people all said skating board, so I kept that going, you know. So, and afterwards, Val was laughing his head off and said, he, he, he mimicked me, a skating board, and he got a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but let's start at the beginning. You mentioned the Germans, and of course, the war was a huge impact on your life and a defining moment in your career too. It's amazing how the two have gone hand in hand, haven't they? Yeah, it wasn't planned really. Yeah. Um, the, 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 we, we got bombed out uh, in when I was three and a half um, in a shelter in the centre of Liverpool, Kirkdale. And uh, we used to have to run into the shelter every night as soon as the sirens were going and then stay there all night until the all clear sirens went off again. Uh, we did that for for weeks, but uh, one night uh, we got bombed and the blast blew the shelter down and killed most of the people in the shelter, including my brother who was six, uh, me and my mother, and, and the, uh, we're, we're sitting next to each other and I was sitting on a babysitter's knee, a, a girl called Mary Munro, mm. who was at 14, and uh, she was killed. So. When the shelter fell on us, I think she probably uh, protected me, um, and that's how I survived. My mother finished up in hospital. She had all uh, uh, concussion, her head was all uh, cut and everything. And my baby sister, who was only uh, 11 or 12 months at the time, uh, my mother had all of her, so she protected her. Um, but my, my brother, unluckily, he, he must have been sitting on his own and took the full blast uh, of the bricks falling on him. And all the people in the street uh, who, were, who were on the far side of the shelter, they were all killed, uh, including the Monroe family. I know you're incredibly young. Do you actually remember that day? I, I always remember the sirens, which would put the wind up anybody. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 you know, so you can still hear them now with the, when the fire fire brigade goes. You know, uh, the station. They're, they're, they're the same sounds. Right. And uh, then the drones of the aeroplanes, and I uh, remember people in the shelter saying, oh, they, that's all right, that, that's one of ours. Uh, they could tell uh, which was a German aeroplane and which was a, a, an English aeroplane, right. a British aeroplane, by the sounds of the drones of the, uh, of the engines. So they would be sitting there and, you know, they'd be saying, oh, but all right, that's one of ours, and everybody was relieved. And then they could hear the bangs going. Uh, and the other thing I remember was sitting on a slate um, on, the, on a bomb site uh, where someone had dug me out the shelter. I think it must be an ARP warden or somebody and put me on the slate and then went in to get other people out. And I remember just sitting there and the, the sun just coming up and uh, looking round, smoke and no houses about and grit in my teeth. Wow. Um, and I'll never forget that uh, whenever I get a little bit of sand or grit in my teeth, it goes back to that particular night. Yeah. And that's the, you know, and that, I mean, I, I think what happens, you always remember stuff that's traumatic. And, uh, you know, if you, if you fall off a bike or someone smacks you in the head with, with a brick or something like that, you, you remember them things, you know. And I suppose that's it was, it was a big effect on me, that, you know. And I suppose you're never the same again. Your mother in that house is always going to be thinking um, about that, even if you're not. Terrible because we, uh, when we've we've lost my brother and we've lost the house, uh, and my mother's in hospital, uh, unconscious, and I'm to find me in the morgue um, with my brother. So I must have been sort of. Uh, I think them days, they, they, they were, when you think about, it, there was two or three thousand people who were, who were killed on that night what the hospital would have been and them days it's only about three or four hospitals about right. about four or five ambulances and about you know 20 nurses so it must have been horrendous on that night when everybody started bringing in people who were injured or, or dying and, and where to put them and i believe that they were all over the hospital up the alleyways and the people who were killed they had the names of the roads where, where they where they were found and the, and the houses and the shelters uh, on, on um, all lying along the wards with a, a cardboard uh, plaque saying uh, Morley Street or Back Castle Street, wow. and people come along then to try to identify who the who the, who the loved ones were. Um, and my uncle, who was fourteen, had come along um, to find me because he went to the house and wasn't there. She wasn't there then. And he went to Stanley Hospital, which was only about a mile away, yeah. half a mile away, to find to, to look for me. Anyway, he found me, and uh, found me mum, and uh, in in the hospital. 
and that was it. So my dad was all, my dad was in the army. He was in um, he was in the Royal Artillery, but he was in Woolwich, and they were uh, you know sort of protecting London. Uh, and I often wonder what it was like when he got the telegram or when he got, was told that you know you get back to Liverpool, you on leave, and uh, but your house is gone and your son's been killed, and you, you know. I, I just wonder him sitting on that train for a day, because yeah. then days all the disruption. It'd probably take him one or two days to get back from London, and so he'd be walking, to get out of Lime Street Station and walking along Scotland Road to Kirkdale Road, seeing all the blitz in the houses and waiting to see what he was gonna uh, see when he got to the street and get there and there's nothing there. Then he has to go mm. and find us in the hospitals and that, you know. So then we have to try and build that. Me mum and dad have to try and build their life. Uh, from that, from nothing, uh, you couldn't have gone any lower than that. And uh, the, the, the strange thing about it, my dad had got two weeks leave, and he stayed over, still trying to find his houses and accommodation. And he uh, he got arrested for staying over his leave, and the police took him back to London. Wow. The MPs took him back, uh, so we were left on our own again, and and we finished up uh, having getting. Billeted uh, with uh, a family uh, in uh, in Dovecot Heighton uh, because then days he was uh, I think um, because all the homeless people were, were got put up by uh, by by you know people who were probably getting paid by the government to take people in so right. we had one room for about three or four six months and then we moved into the council house where we where we lived which was uh, a proper street nice house and. And my dad had come a couple of years later. My dad come out of the army, and uh, that's when we had to pick ourselves. My mum and dad had to pick themselves up. I guess they say out of all that adversity comes humour and positivity. Can you remember how long it was before you could all laugh together again as a family, and I that became my mother, normal? My mother had the greatest sense of humour. Right. You know, and to, to, I mean, there was there was we were ten. My mum had ten kids. Uh, she'd lost three. Uh, one of the bomb and, and, uh, and two before that and uh, I had six sisters and uh, we lived in a, a two bedroom uh, house uh, and it was it was fun it was numbers laughing all the time joking and uh, she worked hard at them days they didn't have a big fridge or anything like that so every day she was shopping we had, and we had to meet her every day with the bags and, and she'd walk about half a mile back to the house, wow. and uh, and that's how it, that's how it was. We had to meet our mothers every day, four o'clock, to pick up the shop. Ah, oh, fantastic! And then we moved forward, and you didn't want to be a comedian. You wanted to be a footballer, didn't you? That was your big passion. Well, I think when, when I was in this council, uh, when we were in the council house in the street, there was all lads there. All we had to do was play with the ball. We didn't have much money. We played with the tennis ball. Uh, without the fear on it, obviously. <laughs> but we, we'd kick this ball around forever, you know, and I suppose the coordination of kicking that ball and nothing else to do. I mean, there's no television, there's no, uh, there's nothing in the house that you could st want to stay in for. So everything was outside on the street, playing up scotch and playing tick and all the games that we used to play them days. Yeah, they, I don't know whether the kids do that now because they all seem to be sitting on computers, but... Uh, we, we were sort of out from school then at four o'clock we'd be out in the streets until it went dark and it was at hide and seek uh, all, all, all the games that uh, in the streets were, were fantastic and uh, that made us fitter and cricket would be in the summer we have a lamp post and a, a little cricket bat that someone's dad had made out of a piece of wood and a ball and that was us for four or five hours and then the football season had started then we'd be then football, playing football and then we'd go down to the local picture house watching the uh, cowboy films and we'd all be playing cowboys and Indians so it was, uh, it was all quite uh, different than today I think yeah, I'm not quite as old as you, but I hold in my head in my hands when I see these kids walking around with their mobile phones, looking around fields at imaginary characters trying to zap them on Pokemon. It seems like yeah. we've lost perspective of what fun is. Yeah, I, yeah you, you often think of that. Now. And, and I mean, I've got grandchildren now and they're lovely kids, but uh, we've banned them from in restaurants and uh, cafes because 
there's nothing worse than seeing a family all sitting there looking at their iPads yeah. uh, in, in restaurants and no, no interaction. No, and, the, and the kids can't, uh, haven't got a conversation in them. Right. Um, because they're all looking at the, 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 the text and the mates or they're playing games with the mates, you know, and you ask them to put them down and they start moaning and crying. So yeah. I, I don't know where it's going. I think one of the reasons there's so many comedians from Liverpool is because you are so articulate, you're so funny, and also it's a melting pot. When you think of the history of the people who came to Liverpool and stayed there, you were ahead of the game in a way, weren't you, with sort of multiculturalism and bringing people together? Chinese friends, and we had had Chinese and uh, Barbados friends and all that. I mean, Liverpool was a melting pot. We had had the biggest Chinese uh, population in in, in um, outside of China in Liverpool because yeah. because of the ships do come down to Mersey they have kooks on and all that and they probably they said oh jump ship or got thrown off the ship or they and they'd stay in Liverpool and then all of a sudden we we've got Chinatown you know and uh, you know Chinatown um, and then we've got uh, Toxus uh, when when everyone come over from uh, Trinidad and Tobago and all places like that yeah. And it all mixed in. It was great. And then we move forward to comedy and, of course, your big break on Opportunity Knocks and then, of course, The Comedians. That's where we first saw you on TV. When was the first time you stood on a stage? Well, funny enough, um, you, you know, I I used to live in Dovecourt and you, the, the strangest thing, and you mentioned them, Ken Dodd. Ken Dodd used to deliver. He was, he was a, he, his dad had a coal business, yeah. and that was only in Notty Ash. And he is a place called Notty Ash, yes. and people don't believe there is. <laughs> but it, 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 and it, it, there's no jam butty mines there, but no. <laughs> there is a place called Notty Ash. And uh, it, 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 that was only about uh, oh, half a mile from where I lived. And he'd come along the street in a van, and you know, not many people had cars and vans, but he had a van, and he'd have Aunt Sally, which, which is like a liquid soap, and he'd have bleach. And he's coming to our house. My mum would buy a bottle of bleach off him and a bottle of Aunt Sally. Wow. And uh, you know that was to clean the steps and clean the floors. Aunt Sally was like a sort of uh, a, a, a disinfectant thing. And he had a little bag. And he was about, he must have been about 20, 25, I don't know. And uh, my dad said, oh, I saw you on uh, the Heighton UDC Club in Heighton. And he'd, he'd be there, you know, with his teeth. Yeah. And my dad said, tell him a joke. And the first joke Ken Dodd told me in my in my uh, house in Eiton, in Dovecott, uh, it, right outside, I can still remember sitting by the gate, and he's got the two bottles in his hand, he says, I'm the only one in Liverpool who can eat an apple through a tennis racket. <laughs> 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 and that was the first, and uh, you know, and I'm I, I'm sort of, I'd never seen his act or not like that until I went to Blackpool and saw him in Blackpool, and I thought he was fantastic. And when yeah. he used to hold an audience, it was brilliant. Do you think there's ever been a greater front of cloth comedian? I mean, his timing, his pure tenacity, and at 87 still be selling out these huge theatres is remarkable. Yeah, he, he is, and, and he and he appeals to everybody as well. And he's one of the cleanest comedians as well. He doesn't have to swear. Uh, and there's not, you know, there's nothing that you could take your kids to see him, uh, and he'll entertain them. His pantomimes are great. His diddy men are wonderful in the pantos and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I'm a big fan of Ken. And then we go forward to TV, and of course, your most famous legendary appearance was on Des O'Connor. Have you embraced that now? Because I watched it again last night, and by 2016 standards, it's just funny and not outrageous. But of course, back in the day, it was, and it got you huge press, didn't it? Well, it did actually. Yeah, I don't know why, because it was. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I still don't understand it. But uh, it was. I, I'm. I'm glad I did it, and. Uh, and um, because, it still, as you said, it still stands up today. Um, I get so many, even if I go to a club now, people who haven't seen me, they say, oh, let's Google them. And I don't even put that on Google or whatever it is, or iTunes, whatever it is. Yeah. It's, uh, it's there, and it'll be there forever, I suppose. It will. And it is still very funny. And when you did that Fokker thing, did they know anything about it, and how did Des react afterwards? Well, funny enough, I did about four or five Des O'Connor shows, and the funny thing about it, everybody only remembers that one. Yeah. So there must be a, there must be a sort of, 
you know, must be something there uh, that gets into people's heads uh, and forgets other stuff. And that's why people don't remember jokes, but they remember catchphrases. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, it's uh, even the best joke in the world. People won't remember it of, uh, of a comedian, but they'll remember, uh, you know, Frank Carson. It's the way I tell them. You know what I mean? And, uh, the, uh we all got to have a gimmick. Of course, I'd be nice to see her, to see you nice, but you don't remember any other joke or no. any gag, what they did. And Carson used to do an hour's gags. I probably remember only two gags, but when you say, who's this? It's the way I tell them. <laughs> it's a strange thing. A catchphrase is more important than the joke. Is it tough getting older when you see so many? Last week I spoke to Jim Bowen and we were talking about how many comedians we've lost and there really is very few greats left now. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, everyone has got to move on, haven't we? I mean, yep. even when we were young, there was uh, Arthur Asky and people like that and the goons and all them sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah there's, there seems to be like sort of... Uh, uh, at this moment in time, the old comedians are just dropping like flies. Um, so, hang on, just let me feel, put feel my pulse. Yeah. Next to you. <laughs> and are you doing well? Are I'm you I'm keeping still, well? I'm still fit as a fiddle. I mean, a lot of the lads who uh, the, the comedians, they were, they, were, they were sort of like the darts players. They were drinking pints of lager and drinking beer and smoking and all that. Yeah. You know, thank God I've never smoked. But, um, uh, I've kept myself quite fit over the years, so uh, hopefully there's a few years left in me. But uh, uh, yes, it, uh, all the good things come to an end. And then we look at your comedy show now, and I was looking at clips again last night on YouTube, and you still have a ferocious ability to deliver a gag. You seem to still love it. Do you know what? Because I've, I had a, a very, very bad start in life. Yeah. Uh, I was. We, 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 I had to go into a home when I was about five or six uh, because uh, of the situation that we were in with the bomb and all that. And then I went into another one where my mother couldn't cope with us because she had too many kids. So, <laughs> and so I don't know. I think you bring all this along with you. It's, right. it's, uh, you carry it through life, and you either, you know, sort of uh, pack in or you know go go nuts. Or you you just carry on with it. But I've I've had a I I've had a, a, a really fantastic uh, life, um, and I've been a pipe fitter welder. I've been a lorry driver. Uh, I've done about thirty forty jobs. I've been in the army, did my national service, and this comedian thing, standing up on stage and telling jokes and making people laugh, and getting paid for it. It's yeah. probably the best job in the world. I, I went to Norris the other day, and I'm, I'm on the road for four and a half hours, and I'm passing wagons and lorries, and, and I'm thinking yeah. to myself, them poor fellas there, I've got to drive that distance uh, <coughs> every day. Yeah. And then park the wagon up, go to sleep, get up next morning, and drive again. And, uh, you know, and to, for me to stand on the stage for an hour, I would never swap that for the world. And I wouldn't get home till seven o'clock at night. You know, you look at these things, you think, bloody hell how lucky how lucky I am yeah uh, but when you get these young lads who are just starting off now who are only 18 19 20 or comedians now they haven't uh, they haven't they, they haven't lived that life yeah uh, and you know hopefully they'll cope well with it but uh, you know they, they, they might get depressed they might be miserable or something but they shouldn't do yeah it's perspective isn't it Congratulations on everything. It's so great to talk to you, and I wish you well. Just as you look out the window at the moment, there aren't any fuckers passing, are there? Well, do you want? You can hear one now. I'm going to listen. There's one just got for this one of ours. <laughs> <laughs> is it a little one or a big one? I, I, I don't know who it is, but you know, I said if I ever do the Des O'Connor show, I won't, uh, won't tell his, I, won't, I won't tell him jokes about uh, fucking wolves again. Uh, I'll tell I'll, I'll tell a joke about a British aeroplane. Uh, the only trouble is it's got a wankle engine. Uh. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a sh I'll make a sh joke about that. <laughs> Did he have grace afterwards? Did he find it funny? Because in the chair he found it hysterical. Although I can appreciate when you're live on air, it can be um, concerning. I think the thing is, is that you know things have changed now. Uh, uh, 
them days, there was no... And in actual fact, I wasn't swearing on the Des O'Connor show. No. He was an airplane called a fucking wolf. And I think it's because of liberal accents. It comes over as swearing. Yes. But, you know... But you knew what you were doing. It's a great gag. Come on. Oh, it's a gag, isn't it? It's a gag. It's an old gag. I mean, it's not... Well, I never put a in so, but it's, as a, it's as an old gag. There's, there's, a, there's a different ways of doing it. That yeah. was the way I did it. And uh, I think uh, it came over. I mean, if you heard the audience laughing on there, that was oh, genuine. Was wonderful. There's no canned laughter like it is now. Yeah. People forget that Freddie Starr was on that show. Oh, was and he? And then the next person to come on was Oliver Reed. So, oh, Christ. You, you should really watch him on there. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. We, we become good friends. I went to his house in uh, Guernsey, me and my mate. And uh, my mate said, I've got to get up there early in the morning. He said to catch the uh, first plane out of, out of Guernsey. And Ollie said, You know, we're staying, we're staying, we're having a drink. And Ollie had handcuffed him to the bed. Oh, Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Stan Borman, it's so lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope to see you live soon. You're one of our greatest legends and funny people. I really appreciate your time.